Jason Chandler sat on the couch, fixated on his phone until Karen, his wife of nearly ten years, called with unsettling news. Earlier, a private investigator had revealed Karen's deceit. She and her lover were en route to Honolulu, contrary to her claims. Jason pondered his naivety, having devoted a decade to their relationship now shattered by her lies. Taking a gulp of coffee, he reclined, reflecting on their history. They met in college thirteen years prior, both pursuing business degrees. Their romance blossomed, leading to marriage. Post-graduation, Jason joined his father's tire business, mastering various roles and ascending to head the accounting department. He aspired to inherit the company from his father and succeed Mike Allen, the retiring CFO. After marrying, Karen pursued a career as a realtor, excelling even during tough market times. They lived comfortably, with a nice house and new cars, seemingly secure in their marriage. Though they were childless, he saw it as a blessing. Initially, Karen mentioned fertility issues, opting for tubal ligation. Despite suggesting adoption, she declined. Recently, her increased social outings sparked his suspicion, especially her late returns home. Despite expressing his concerns, she dismissed them, attributing her absences to work stress. What were you doing out so late? He inquired as she returned home one night, looking disheveled with a scent of cigarettes clinging to her clothes. Just hanging out, having a few drinks, she replied defensively. It's my business, Jace. I can take care of myself. Jason was taken aback by her tone, a departure from her usual demeanor. Seeing his reaction, she softened. I'm sorry, Jace, she apologized. It's just work stress getting to me. You've handled market pressures before without this, he pointed out. What's changed? It's tougher than ever out there, she explained. Competition's fierce and the pressure's relentless. I get it, but don't take it out on me, he reassured her. I'm on your side, she hugged him, expressing regret. You're right, dear, I'm sorry. Agreed, but please freshen up, he requested. You reek of smoke. Apologies, it was smoky at the club, she conceded, heading for a shower. He was already asleep when she joined him in bed. Over time, their closeness dwindled from several times a week to barely once a fortnight. Her interest in his life waned, and he noticed her blatant lies, like the day she claimed to be at the office when she wasn't. He refrained from confronting her, sensing her potential explosive reaction. He pondered how many more lies she might have told. Lying awake beside her, he gazed at her, his worry evident. What's on your mind, Jace? she inquired. I'm worried, he admitted. About what? she probed. Us, he confessed. It feels like we're growing apart. Do you still love me? Of course, sweetheart, she reassured, embracing him. You know that, right? Uh, I honestly don't know, he confessed. It's been a while since you said it, and our closeness has dwindled. You're out more than you're home. I'm sorry, she apologized. Work's been overwhelming. I do love you. Please trust me. Can you show me more? He requested. Of course, baby, she affirmed, kissing him. They made love that night, soothing Jason's worries temporarily. But concerns lingered. A month passed and the cycle repeated. Jason began to suspect something deeper. One day, his friend Ron asked to meet urgently. Sure, let's grab a beer, Jason agreed. I can't explain over the phone, Ron insisted. They met at the bar, and Ron dropped a bombshell. I saw your wife today, Ron disclosed. Yeah, she's in real estate showing houses, Jason shrugged. I'm certain, Ron affirmed, but I never knew real estate involved such closeness. Seriously? Jason exclaimed. You must be kidding. I wish I were, Ron sighed. I saw Karen with another man holding hands and kissing. It wasn't innocent. That can't be right, Jason protested. Are you sure it was Karen? Ron showed him a photo, confirming his suspicions. Damn, Jason muttered, asking for a copy of the picture. Sure thing, Ron agreed, sending it over. What's your plan? I'm at a loss, Jason admitted. This blindsided me. My friend's a PI, Ron offered. Want me to connect you? Please do, Jason requested. I need answers. After parting ways, Jason found Karen at home. You're back early, he remarked, surprised. Just in time, she smiled. Where were you? Having a drink with Ron, he explained. Everything okay with your friend? Not really, Jason shared. His wife's been unfaithful. Oh? Karen feigned innocence. Yeah, Jason replied. It's a nightmare I'm glad we don't have. Karen's reaction didn't escape Jason's notice. It would crush me if you ever betrayed me, he remarked, observing her subtle flinch. I'd never betray you, she assured, embracing him. I love you too much. 
Glad to hear it, he replied, kissing her. What brings you home early? Our company's convention starts this weekend, she explained. I wanted to pack early and spend time with you before we're apart. Where's it held? he inquired. Las Vegas, at the Westgate Resort Hotel, she answered. We leave Friday after lunch. Another award this year? he asked, aware of her past achievements. I suppose, she replied. They kissed again, and he suggested celebrating their anniversary in Vegas. She declined, citing work commitments. Disheartened, he agreed to celebrate later. The next day, he contacted Ron for a PI recommendation. Before lunch, he met with the investigator. Good morning, Mr. Chandler. The investigator greeted him in his cluttered office. Glad to meet you, Ron greeted. Call me Jerry. What's the deal? Jason briefed him on Karen's Vegas trip. Vegas, huh? Jerry mused. You think she's up to something there? Could be, Jason admitted. I've got contacts there who owe me favors, Jerry offered. We'll keep tabs on her and can set up surveillance if you give me a room number. It'll cost extra. Expected as much, Jason nodded. But I need to know the truth. Jerry handed him a digital audio recorder. Easy to use. Just slip it under her car seat, voice activated, retrieve it later. She usually parks at the airport, Jason noted. Perfect, Jerry nodded. We'll handle it. If she slips up, we'll know. Here's my private line for updates. Thanks, Jason said, taking the number. Thanks, Jason said, writing a check from his personal account, not the joint one. They had separate personal accounts and agreed to allocate up to 10% of their earnings. Jason usually spent his on clothes and gifts for Karen, saving for a cruise until now. That night, Karen packed for the trip. Jason offered to help, noticing her excessive luggage. Curious, he peeked inside and found birth control pills, despite her previous claim of tubal ligation. He photographed her belongings, noting club attire and revealing bikinis, including an open micro bikini he'd never seen her wear. He discreetly placed an audio recorder in her car and ensured it was activated before locking up. This might be the last time, Jason pondered sadly, foreseeing their closeness fading as husband and wife. The next morning, Karen shared her hotel room number and promised nightly calls. Love you she said, kissing him. Love you too, he replied, watching her drive off. At work, he informed Jerry of Karen's room number. Got it, thanks, Jerry acknowledged, ready to deploy his team. Later, Karen called from the airport, planning to update him upon check-in. Love you, she reiterated. Love you too, baby, he echoed internally, concealing his doubts. When his father approached, sensing his distress, Jason confided in him. That's rough, son, his father sympathized. I never would have guessed. Same here, Dad, Jason agreed. If you need us, we're here, his father offered. Thanks, Dad, Jason appreciated. Leaving work early, he found Karen's car at the airport, retrieving the audio recorder. Despite the tidy car, doubt lingered. On the drive home, Karen called. Hey, just got here, she informed him. Thanks for telling me, he acknowledged. Just settling in, she continued. I'll call you tonight, love you. Love you too, he reciprocated. At home, he activated the audio recorder, hoping for nothing incriminating. Mostly, there was road noise and her radio. Halfway through, however, reality hit. He listened to her conversation via Bluetooth. Hey, baby, a man's voice greeted. Hello, stallion, she flirted. A stud muffin? Jason scoffed internally. Who's this clown? Last week was amazing, the man reminisced. Glad you enjoyed it, she giggled. Plans for next week? Already arranged, he confirmed. Did you tell your husband? Not yet, she admitted. I've got it handled. He suspect anything? The man inquired. Nothing, she assured. He's clueless. Hope you're right, he said. He'll believe anything, she boasted. Okay, he conceded. Pulling up to the airport, she announced. See you at the hotel tonight, okay? Can't wait, he replied. Bye, love. Bye-bye, she concluded, ending the call. Jason stared at the tape recorder, shocked by what he'd heard. He replayed the recording to ensure he hadn't misinterpreted. She wasn't just cheating. She had plans for their anniversary week that didn't involve him. Frustrated, he cursed internally and pondered the duration of her affair and who her partner was. Grabbing a beer, he sat at his desk, contemplating recent events. Had he overlooked obvious signs? He questioned what else she might be concealing. He had respected her privacy but now felt compelled to investigate. Knowing where she kept the key, he retrieved it from their jewelry box and headed to her office in the spare bedroom. He accessed the desk, driven by betrayal to investigate. Inside, he uncovered a web of lies. Karen had deceived him throughout their marriage. Shockingly, her personal account held over 250 dollars 
far exceeding their agreed-upon savings limit. Examining her expenses, he found lavish gifts, including a pricey men's Rolex watch likely for her lover. Her purchases also revealed expensive clothing and visits to Planned Parenthood for feticides, which she paid for in cash. He pondered the paternity of the terminated pregnancies and her consistent use of birth control over the years. Additionally, he discovered a receipt for Plan B pills purchased just days earlier. And there's more. He found a recent receipt for a hefty down payment on an apartment in an affluent neighborhood, pondering if it would serve as her love nest or an exit strategy. Other receipts revealed payments for utilities and new furniture, prompting him to consider if one of the keys he found was for her new place. Determined to investigate further, he powered up her computer, finding passwords conveniently listed beneath the keyboard. He accessed her email, surprised to find her credentials saved, indicating her confidence in her secrecy. Shockingly, he uncovered exchanges with Greg Wilson detailing their carnal encounters, dating back nearly a year when he first noticed changes in her behavior. Initially meeting in hotel rooms, they later rendezvoused in houses she was selling. One email from six months prior provided some answers to his questions. Did you handle that little issue? Greg inquired. Yep, Karen replied. I went and had an feticide today. Shame you didn't keep the baby, Greg remarked. You could have passed it off as Jason's. I can't do that, she explained. He thinks I can't conceive. He'd figure out it wasn't his. Reflecting on six months ago, Jason realized that was when he first caught her lying. Damn, he thought to himself. She's a deceitful, cheating woman. He scrolled through their emails. Greg had suggested they have lovemaking in Karen's marital bed, but she refused. I won't betray Jason like that, she wrote to Greg. That idiot has no clue, he replied. I won't do it, she insisted. What if you had your own place, Greg proposed. You could afford it with your earnings, and your husband would be clueless. Maybe you're onto something, she replied. I have my own account, and Jason never questions it. I'll start looking. That was three months ago. The down payment receipt was just over a month old. I got a condo, she told Greg. I put a down payment, and I'm getting furniture next week. Jason's oblivious. Perfect, Greg responded. We'll have fun all over that place. Jason was stunned by this news. He kept reading the emails. Why stay with your husband? Greg asked. Why not leave and get your own place? Believe it or not, I care for him, Karen said. He may be a cocky accountant at a tire store chain, but I have feelings for him and he treats me right. I got the condo so we could meet without risking exposure at hotels. Plus, you're still married. Hey, just give the word and I'll dump Christy, Greg offered. She's a headache. Let's see after the conference, Karen replied. What happens after the conference? Greg pondered. Jason began printing out Karen's letters and copying the receipts he had discovered. Just as he was doing so, Karen's number flashed on the display. Hello? He answered cautiously. It's me, baby, Karen greeted. Are you okay? You sound off. Got a pounding headache, he lied, not wanting to tip her off. Just settling in for the night, she informed. Take something for that headache and rest. Love you and miss you, she added. Yeah, same here, he muttered. Bye. Ending the call, he pondered if she noticed his lack of affectionate words. In truth, he was seething. Determined to uncover the truth about Greg, he scoured Karen's company website and found him. Greg Wilson, the regional manager. She was indeed involved with her boss. Printing the page, he added it to his pile. Growing more agitated, he contemplated breaking into her apartment. Checking her address, he hesitated, wondering about a security system. Reviewing her documents, he spotted a code labeled Alarm System. Of course she'd write it down, he thought bitterly. Closing her laptop, he left, grabbing latex gloves from the garage to avoid leaving evidence. Finding her complex, he parked in her spot and approached her door. Donning his gloves, he tested a key from her jewelry box. The door yielded, and he entered. Spotting the alarm remote, he inputted the code he'd discovered and ensured the alarm was disarmed. Switching on the light, he surveyed the apartment, admiring Karen's furniture choices. She's always had good taste, he mused. Shame her loyalty doesn't match her decor preferences. As expected, there were no pictures of him. This was her love nest, her retreat from their marriage. Stepping into the kitchen, he noted a few plates and utensils. The fridge was empty, the pantry bare. Surprisingly, the house was fully furnished, adorned with flower portraits, and boasted a large flat-screen TV. Entering the bedroom, he found it likewise furnished, with lace curtains cascading elegantly over the windows, 
just above the electric heater, an apparent fire hazard. Opening drawers, he discovered unfamiliar underwear and suspected Greg's presence from men's undergarments. Taking out his phone, he snapped photos. In the nightstand drawer, a card from Greg confirmed his suspicions. Thanks for the watch, it read. Looking forward to your housewarming. Love, Greg. Anger surged. He imagined confronting Greg. More clothing, both male and female, filled the dressing room. In the master bathroom, he noticed two toothbrushes by the sink and his and hers towels next to the shower. He grabbed his phone, snapping a few more photos. In the second bedroom, a small desk and chair were the only furnishings. A network cable lay on the desk, likely for her laptop. Amid the letters addressed to her, all from utility companies, he ensured her name and address were visible in the pictures. Lace curtains like those in the bedroom covered the windows here, also draping over the electric heater. He noted several potential fire hazards, including the absence of smoke detectors in the bedrooms and the aged one in the kitchen. He wondered if it even had a battery. Confirming everything was as he found it, he switched off the lights, activated the security system, and departed, double-checking the locked door. Returning to his car, he pondered his next steps. Divorce was inevitable. He couldn't trust her again, even if she severed ties with her lover and relinquished the apartment. Aware men often fare poorly in such situations, he hoped her higher income would spare him alimony. Consulting a lawyer seemed wise before proceeding. He also hoped her sole ownership of the apartment meant he wouldn't have to surrender their home or divide its sale proceeds. He felt she had abandoned him by purchasing the apartment secretly. With no children, custody and support were non-issues, but he wanted retribution for their betrayal. Violence was out of the question. He had no desire for jail time. Returning home, he searched the phone book and located an ad for Gregory Wilson. Hoping it was the same Greg Wilson, he dialed the number. Wilson residence, a woman's voice answered. Is this Mrs. Wilson? He inquired. Yes, it is, she confirmed. Who am I speaking to? Jason Chandler, he introduced himself. Your husband is the regional manager for Acme Real Estate, he verified. Yes, he is, she replied. But he's away at a conference this weekend and will be visiting other offices next week. You'll need to call the regional office and leave a message for him there. Actually, Mrs. Wilson, it's you I'd like to speak with, Jason redirected. Oh, she responded. Yes, ma'am, Jason continued. I hate to break this to you, but my wife is having an affair with your husband. Are you certain? She inquired. Absolutely, Jason asserted, and I can provide evidence. Do you have solid proof? She pressed. I can even show you where they meet up if you'd like, Jason offered. He heard her sigh through the phone. Would tomorrow work for you? She proposed. Certainly, Jason agreed. What time suits you best? Around one o'clock in the afternoon, she suggested. Providing her with Karen's apartment address and directions, Jason concluded, I'll see you then, before ending the call. Grinning, he approached his desk and began drafting a to-do list. First on the agenda, change the door locks, ensuring it was done before meeting Greg's wife at Karen's place. The temptation to drown his sorrows in booze crossed his mind, but he dismissed it. Opting instead for a cold pizza slice, he mulled over his options. Satisfied, he ascended the stairs and retired for the night. Early the next day, he visited the hardware store, purchasing supplies to replace the locks and crafting an extra key for the apartment. By noon, all locks were switched. After showering, he grabbed his audio recorder and the printed emails from Karen's account, then headed to her apartment to rendezvous with Greg's wife. Spotting Karen's car, he approached a Toyota Corolla nearby, where an attractive, dark-haired woman sat. Knocking on her window, he inquired, Are you Christy Wilson? She confirmed her identity, and he opened the door for her. Call me Jason Chandler, he said, gesturing for her to don latex gloves he offered. Let's head in. I'll show you their hideaway. Using the spare key, he successfully unlocked the door, deactivating the security alarm as they entered. Jason guided her into the bedroom, opening drawers and revealing Greg's clothes in the closet. Oh my God, she exclaimed. I've been searching for these for weeks. I wondered where his clothes were disappearing. Has your husband been sporting a Rolex watch lately? Jason inquired. She affirmed, mentioning it was a gift from management. Shaking his head, Jason retrieved a card from Karen's nightstand, displaying it to her. Reading the note, she burst into tears. Is that his handwriting? Jason questioned. Yes, she sobbed. But wait, there's more, he added, presenting the emails and activating the audio recorder. Tearfully, she read the emails before listening to the Friday recording. I'm sorry, Jason said, embracing her and restraining his own emotions. 
It's not your fault, she assured. I've suspected something but lacked proof. Composing herself, she faced him. So what's the plan? She inquired. I'm filing for divorce, he declared. And I'll kick him out as soon as I lay eyes on him, she vowed. Suddenly, she brightened. I have an idea, she exclaimed. What if we help them move in together here? Jason pondered momentarily before smiling. I like it, he agreed. But we need to act fast. They'll be back soon. Greg said he'd be away for a week after the convention, she revealed. I bet Karen will find a reason to leave too. Recalling the recorded conversation, Jason cursed. Damn, you're right, he admitted. But I want her stuff out of my house pronto. Agreed, she concurred. Meet me back here in three hours. Sounds good, Jason agreed. I'll bag her stuff. I should be back in time. See you then, she said, rising. Jason observed her, struck by her petite stature and charm. He couldn't fathom why Greg would cheat on her. They left the condo and arrived three hours later, their cars brimming with bags of the couple's belongings. Dumping the bags in the sparsely furnished second bedroom, they didn't worry about breakage, knowing it would take the cheating spouse's hours to sort through everything. I don't know about you, but I wasn't too careful with his stuff, she remarked. Jason chuckled. Same here, he admitted, sharing a high five with her. Glancing at her, he announced, I don't know about you, but I'm famished. Me too, she agreed. I could really go for a juicy hamburger. A big cheesy one. Sounds perfect, he replied. I know just the spot. Care to join me? My treat. Lead the way, she replied. Heading towards the bar he frequented with Ron, she followed. Upon parking, Christy eyed the building skeptically. A bar? she questioned. Trust me, he assured. They serve the best burgers here. You'll love it. Okay, she acquiesced. But I hope you're not planning to ply me with booze and take advantage. Chuckling, he reassured her. As tempting as that sounds, I wouldn't do that, he quipped. Darn, she joked, laughing. Inside, they ordered beers, burgers, and fries, exchanging stories about their failed marriages over the meal. Their narratives shared similarities, meeting in college, quick marriages, but diverging desires regarding children. He inquired if she was a CPA, to which she replied negatively, expressing hopes of pursuing it someday. Jason shared his professional background, mentioning opportunities in his field. Maybe we can help each other out if you give me your resume, he suggested. I can certainly do that, Mr. Chandler, she responded, taking a bite of her burger. His cell phone interrupted the moment with Karen's caller ID flashing. Answering in a neutral tone, he greeted, Hello? Karen's voice, slurred from booze, came through. Hey, baby, she chirped. What are you up to? Just grabbing a burger at the bar, he replied. What's going on with you? Guess what, she blurted out. I won the best salesman award, she announced before he could respond. Congratulations, he said flatly. Yes, and they want me to stay in Vegas next week to work with their agents, she continued, fabricating. He already knew it was a lie. That's great news, he feigned enthusiasm. What about our anniversary this Wednesday, he reminded her. I know, and I'm sorry, she apologized. Maybe we can celebrate next weekend. No worries he assured. I understand your work is important. I wouldn't want you to miss a big opportunity. What's that supposed to mean? She queried. Nothing, he brushed it off. Just that our 10-year anniversary only happens once. But I know your job matters to you. Don't stress about it. Yes, work matters. But I thought you'd be happy for me, she sighed. I am, he insisted. Go work with your agents. I'll be fine. I love you, she affirmed. Good, he replied. Me too. Bye. Ending the call, he turned to Christy. That's that, he informed her. She shook her head sympathetically. She picked Greg over your anniversary, she remarked, placing a comforting hand on his. He fought back tears. A man he barely knew showed more concern than his own wife. What a disappointment, I'm sorry, she offered. Thanks, he managed, attempting a smile. He retrieved Jerry's card and dialed his private number. Jerry, he greeted when the older man picked up. Jason Chandler here. Just spoke to Karen and she claims she'll be in Vegas for another week. And you don't buy it? Jerry inquired. Not for a second, Jason confirmed. I was just working on your report, but I'll have my guys surveil them and see what unfolds, Jerry continued. We can proceed. The conference wrapped up a couple of hours ago and they're apparently enjoying themselves. Most attendees will be heading home tomorrow. Oh, and your wife and her lover spent last night together. I've got footage you might want to see. I'll email it to you, included in my report. That'd be great, Jerry, Jason acknowledged. Thanks. Ending the call, he turned to Christy. Tomorrow, we'll get to the bottom of this, 
he stated. My PI caught those two lovebirds spending the night together. He's sending over some video footage. Would you care to watch it with me? Not particularly, she admitted, but I feel like I should. Understandingly, he nodded. Well, let's head to my place, he suggested, rising. After settling the bill at the bar, they departed for his house. Once there and settled in his office, the video arrived in his email. Would you like a drink before we start? He offered. Sure, she accepted. Cola, if you have it. I'll grab two colas, he agreed, heading to the kitchen. Returning with cold sodas, he initiated the video, and they observed Karen and Greg engaging in various carnal acts. Both Christy and Jason struggled to contain their emotions as they witnessed their spouses enjoying each other's company. The ensuing pillow talk was even more heartbreaking. What do you reckon our spouses are up to right now? Karen inquired. If I know Christy, she's probably glued to one of her dull movies, Greg replied, or nose deep in one of her silly books. Yeah, I get what you mean, she agreed. I imagine Jason's buried in another one of his tedious spreadsheets or poring over stock reports. Greg smirked. You'd think he's out here saving the world or something? I mean, come on, his old man's company sells tires for crying out loud. What's the big deal? So, have you decided what you're going to tell that idiot after tomorrow's awards banquet? Yep, she confirmed. I'll just say I was requested to stick around in Vegas for a week, filling in for the local reps. He'll swallow it. Hell, he'd believe anything I'd tell him. I could tell him the moon's made of green cheese, and he'd buy it. And by the time he catches on, we'll be lounging on a beach in Hawaii. Greg added, I can't wait to see you flaunting that new sling bikini you snagged. Christy erupted. Hawaii, she exclaimed. That idiot's whisking some floozy off to Hawaii. I'm going to rip his guts out. She turned to Jason. Sorry for calling your wife a floozy. No need to apologize, he responded. I'd say the same thing. They refocused on the video. So, what about your anniversary? Are you just going to skip it? Hawaii sounds a lot more enticing than a night at a steakhouse, she remarked. I pledged to make it up to him. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Greg regarded her. You're ice cold, you know that, he remarked. She shrugged. It's only our 10th anniversary, she explained. There'll be more. Who cares about that? Right now, I need you. With those words, they resumed their activities, prompting Jason to halt the video. I've seen plenty, he stated. Have you? Christy nodded, tears flowing down her cheeks. More than plenty, she affirmed. I'm scheduling a meeting with a divorce attorney come Monday, he disclosed. Would you like to accompany me? Would you mind? She asked softly. Not at all, he reassured. Christy burst into tears, sobbing. Jason wrapped his arm around her, offering a comforting shoulder. Though he felt like crying too, he held back, focusing on consoling her amidst his own emotional turmoil. Would it bother you if I spent the night here? She inquired. No hanky-panky, I just want to cuddle, she clarified. Of course, you're welcome to stay, he replied. Stay as long as you like. Thank you, she expressed. I can't believe I wasted all those years on that idiot. All this time I've been falling for his lies. I totally get it, Jason empathized. He escorted her upstairs to the master bedroom and found an old t-shirt that appeared long enough for her to sleep in. Taking it, she retreated to the bathroom to change. After waiting for her return, he donned his pajamas and settled into bed. She emerged from the bathroom wearing the long t-shirt, and he was almost taken aback by her appearance. He always admired Karen's legs, but Christie's were the slenderest he'd ever seen. She smiled as she slipped under the covers. What's wrong? She asked. Never seen a woman's legs before? None as lovely as yours, Jason complimented. Sweet talk will get you everywhere, sir, she teased. He wrapped his arm around her, drawing her close, savoring her scent. She placed her hand on his chest, snuggling against him. Did you know you're the only woman I've shared a bed with besides my wife for over ten years? He confessed. And you're the only man I've been with besides my husband, she revealed. They gazed into each other's eyes for what felt like an eternity before drifting off to sleep in each other's arms. The next morning, they woke up entwined with each other. Good morning, sleepyhead, she greeted. You don't need to rush out on my account, she added as he rose to use the bathroom. Good morning, beautiful he responded. I'll be quick. He relieved himself in the bathroom, which proved challenging given his state of arousal. Upon returning, he found Christy already tidying up the kitchen and preparing scrambled eggs and bacon for breakfast. Glancing at the clock, he noted it was 8.30 a.m. 
His gaze returned to Christy, enjoying the sight of her cooking in his old t-shirt, momentarily reminiscing about the times Karen used to make breakfast for them. Wow, that smells amazing, he remarked. I hope you don't mind me taking over your kitchen, she said. Not at all, he assured her. I can't recall the last time someone made me breakfast. Karen never cooked for you? She inquired. She used to, he acknowledged, but she stopped a while back, claimed it took too much time and she needed to prepare for her clients. Damn, Christy muttered. Exactly, he concurred. The aroma of bacon filled the air as she placed a generous plate in front of him. He devoured the meal hungrily as if he hadn't eaten in weeks. Wow, that was amazing. Do you cook like this every morning? Whenever I can, she replied. His phone interrupted, displaying Jerry's name and number. Hey, Jerry, he greeted. Working Sundays now? Jerry chuckled. More often than I'd like, he admitted. I wanted to update you. Your wife and her lover boarded their flight from Las Vegas just before six o'clock this morning. They had a layover in Los Angeles for about 40 minutes. And the plane departed an hour ago. They'll touch down in Honolulu in approximately five hours. I've got the flight details if you need them. Got it, Jason confirmed. They're on American Airlines Flight 31, Jerry added. I've got a contact in Honolulu ready to track them once they land. Thanks, Jerry, Jason said, jotting down the information. After ending the call, he turned to Christy. Well, he began, here's the update. They're en route to Hawaii. As the plane ascended, Karen settled into her seat. Glancing out the window, she watched as they flew over the Pacific Ocean. This is it, she mused to herself. Glancing to her left, she noticed Greg already asleep in the neighboring seat. She closed her eyes briefly, reflecting on the past decade. Brief pangs of guilt swept over her for betraying her trusting husband. Somewhere deep down, she acknowledged this as just another in a series of poor choices. Yet she justified it to herself. She hoped it would all resolve without Jason ever finding out. Perhaps their marriage would continue, and they would grow old together, eventually retiring peacefully. Her initial misstep was disclosing to Jason that she couldn't conceive. In reality, she was capable, but she harbored no desire for a family. Motherhood might allure some, but not her. Thus, she informed Jason of purported medical hurdles necessitating tubal ligation. He accepted, eventually consenting. However, complications with the IUD arose, compelling her to discontinue its use due to pelvic discomfort and headaches. She resorted to conventional birth control pills, supplementing with the calendar rhythm method to avoid physical engagement during peak fertility. Though mostly effective, she found herself pregnant twice. The first instance occurred with her husband. Fearing his response, which would unveil her initial deceit and her reluctance for parenthood, she discreetly underwent infanticide, financing it privately. Luckily, they had established separate accounts alongside a joint one. Initially, they agreed on her contributing 10% of her earnings to the joint account, but she manipulated the arrangement. She could have funded the feticide independently, keeping Jason unaware. The second pregnancy arose with Greg, approximately six months prior. She divulged the situation to her paramour and opted for another feticide, covering the cost from her personal account, hoping Jason would remain oblivious. Then came her extramarital affairs. Throughout the initial seven years of marriage, she remained loyal to her husband. However, everything shifted one day when she encountered a client, strikingly handsome and affluent. In a fleeting moment, she made a decision she never regretted. They engaged in intense, passionate closeness within the confines of a lavish house she was showcasing, and he exhibited gratitude by purchasing the property outright. Such encounters were infrequent, maybe occurring ten times over the subsequent year and a half. Later, she discovered others engaged in similar behaviors. Though she experienced fleeting guilt, she reasoned, What the heck? If other women could indulge without consequence, why couldn't she? In her view, it bore no relation to Jason. Her love for him remained steadfast, and what he didn't know wouldn't cause injury. Then she encountered Greg, and everything altered. He embodied everything her husband lacked. Jason was analytical, pondering decisions meticulously, whereas Greg was impulsive, deciding on a whim. Jason's path in life, both personally and professionally, had been predetermined. He dedicated his career to his father's tire business, a trajectory he continued, set to ascend to CFO and ultimately president and CEO. Conversely, Greg's future was uncertain. He embraced each day as it came, living in the moment while Jason contemplated the future. Their approaches in bed were starkly different. Jason prioritized her pleasure, while Greg was more forceful, leaving her feeling shattered. 
Initially, their liaisons occurred in discreet motels or houses they were selling, but she grew apprehensive about being spotted and alerting Jason or Greg's wife, Christy. Then, after Jason voiced concerns about their relationship, she distanced herself from Greg, momentarily redirecting her affection toward her husband. However, her resolve waned, and Greg sought to reconcile, but she feared Jason discovering their affair. To mitigate this risk, she decided to purchase her own apartment, providing a private sanctuary for her and Greg. Despite Jason's conservative demeanor, she harbored lingering emotions for him. Their decision to file tax returns separately facilitated her departure with Greg while still benefiting from tax breaks. It seemed like a win-win situation, or so she convinced herself. These events culminated in her plan to spend a week in Hawaii with Greg, masking her absence from the office as a vacation with her husband after their corporate meeting. Simultaneously, Greg informed his wife of his upcoming travels, a routine occurrence. She deceived Jason, claiming a week-long trip to Vegas, confident that he would believe her every word. Although she regretted missing their 10th wedding anniversary, she vowed to compensate upon her return, ensuring her secret remained intact. She grinned as she gazed at the azure water beneath them, thoughts drifting to Hawaii. Greg had purchased a daring open bikini for their trip, eager to watch her undress and indulge in beachside self-pleasure. The notion stirred arousal between her thighs, tempting her to succumb to the urge right then and there. Contemplating a clandestine bathroom rendezvous later, she glanced at her phone, half expecting a message from Jason. His preference for calls or face-to-face -face communication didn't surprise her. A smirk played on her lips. A sudden shudder and change in engine pitch hinted at turbulence. As the plane dipped and the engines altered their tone, dread crept in. Glancing out the window, she realized the gravity of the situation. Panic erupted in the cabin, gravity pressing her into her seat. The sight outside confirmed their descent. Oh God, she thought, resignation flooding her. This is it. We're going down. I'm going to die. Oxygen masks deployed. Passengers, including Greg, screamed as flight attendants braced them for the inevitable. Tears streaming, she cast a final glance at her phone, steeling herself for one last decision. Jason and Christy wrapped up breakfast, tidying away the last of the dishes before returning to the table to strategize about their unfaithful partners. Jason admired Christy's analytical skills, feeling a newfound closeness with her that had been absent with Karen for months. As he returned to the table with a fresh cup of coffee, his phone buzzed, displaying Karen's name and number. Putting it on speaker, he answered, greeted by Karen's panicked voice amidst background clamor and distant shouts. Jace! she yelled, barely audible over the chaos. Karen, what's happening? he asked, straining to hear. Plane, down, sorry! Her voice crackled before the call abruptly ended. Stunned, Jason and Christy exchanged glances. Attempting to call Karen back proved futile as it went straight to voicemail. Turning to Christy, Jason urged her to contact Greg. Rushing to retrieve her phone from her purse, Christy dialed Greg's number, but it too went unanswered, diverting to voicemail. Jason headed to his home office, powering up his computer to seek more information. After finding the airline's contact number through a search engine, he dialed and, after initial refusal, managed to speak with someone who confirmed they were investigating reports of the plane crash. Leaving his and Christy's contact details, along with Karen and Greg's, he was assured they would be notified of any updates. With nothing further to find online, he estimated it would be at least an hour before they received any news. They headed to the front room, switching on the TV in hopes of catching any news updates. Jason flicked through channels, but there was no breaking news. Reflecting on the events leading up to this moment, he glanced at his phone. Finally, a news network flashed a report that an American Airlines flight bound for Honolulu had crashed in the Pacific Ocean though without providing specifics. Oh God, Christy exclaimed, her hand covering her mouth. Jason embraced her, silently praying for Karen's safety. Despite the strain in their marriage, he couldn't bear the thought of her perishing. An hour later, the phone rang. Jason muted the TV and answered. Mr. Chandler? A woman's voice inquired. Speaking, he confirmed. I'm calling to inform you that your wife's flight has crashed, she relayed. I have no further details at this time, but... We will update you as soon as we learn more. Thank you, Jason responded, ending the call. He and Christy held each other, tears welling in their eyes. Shortly after, Christy's phone rang, delivering the same grim news. Soon after, his father called. It wasn't uncommon. 
His parents often reached out upon hearing news like this. Hey, Jace, his father greeted. Hi, Dad. How are you? Jason replied. Just got back from church. Did you see the news about the accident? His father inquired. Yes, I did, Jason confirmed. It's awful, his father lamented. By the way, how's Karen? Wasn't she on her way back from Vegas? She's not doing well, Dad, Jason disclosed. She was on that plane that crashed. What? His father gasped. What was she doing going to Hawaii without you? She was with her boyfriend, Jason disclosed. Oh my God, his father reacted. I'm sorry to hear that, son. Take a week off and sort things out. Let Mike know if there's anything we can do. Just give me a call, okay? Thanks, Dad, Jason expressed gratefully. He wrapped up the call, his mind swirling with a mix of emotions. On one hand, he felt a deep sorrow knowing Karen was likely gone. Yet anger simmered within him for her betrayal, as well as at himself for not standing up to her. Strangely, the absence of divorce didn't disturb him. However, the realization of shouldering Karen's final expenses, including the apartment, jolted him. Damn, he muttered. He glanced at Christy, pondering how she'd cope. What steps would she take? An idea struck him, prompting him to approach her. Christy, he began. Why not sell your apartment and move in here with me? She met his gaze, tears brimming in her eyes. Are you serious? She questioned. Absolutely, he affirmed. There's a spare room upstairs, and with the upcoming challenges, maybe we can support each other through it all. After a moment's consideration, she responded, Why not? But under one condition. What's that? He inquired. That I share your bed, she stated. Really? Jason's thoughts raced, realizing things were moving quicker than anticipated. Dismissing doubts, he resolved to seize the moment. Sure, he agreed. It's been ages since I felt genuinely comfortable with my husband. Last night was the first time in years I felt fulfilled. Is that all right? More than all right, he assured her. Then it's settled, she confirmed. I'll grab my belongings from home and be back tonight. Jason nodded. I'll be here, he promised. After she departed, he dialed Lucy, Karen's colleague. Hello, she greeted. Lucy, it's Jason Chandler, he identified himself. Oh, hi, Jason, she responded. How is Hawaii? I'm not sure, he admitted. I hear it's lovely this time of year. Why? Lucy's tone shifted. Karen mentioned you two were heading there after the company meeting. I assumed you were en route. Actually, Jason clarified. Karen went, but not with me. She went with Greg. What? Lucy exclaimed, taken aback. That's right, Jason affirmed. However, neither of them made it. The plane they were on crashed in the Pacific Ocean today. You might have seen it in the news. Oh no, Lucy gasped. Do you know if she survived? I doubt any of them did, Jason responded solemnly. I'm deeply sorry, Lucy offered sympathies. Please accept my condolences. Also, the company has life insurance for all employees. I'll handle the paperwork, but I'll need details from the airline. Can you provide them? Yes, I'll gather what I can, Jason promised. But I have a question for you. What's that? Lucy inquired. Were you aware of Karen's affair with Greg? Jason queried. I had my suspicions. There were whispers, but nothing concrete, Lucy admitted. We tend not to gossip about personal matters in the office. I understand, Jason acknowledged. Well, that's all for now. I'll, I'll be in touch. Thank you, Lucy responded. And again, my condolences. That evening, while watching television with Christy, a news report about the crash aired. It stated that the plane's final moments were captured by a crew member aboard a cargo airliner only a couple of miles from the crash site. The TV station aired an amateur video showing the plane rapidly descending nose first. The plane appeared to disintegrate upon impact with the water, the report conveyed. The cargo ship altered its course to aid in the search for survivors. While they retrieved several bodies from the water, unfortunately, there were no survivors. Additionally, they recovered a significant amount of luggage, which included belongings belonging to Karen and Greg. However, their bodies were not among those recovered. In the following months, Jason and Christy experienced a whirlwind of activity. Christy moved in with Jason and sold her own house. Jason had to handle Karen's apartment, which held nothing of value to him. Consequently, he donated everything to Goodwill, which gladly accepted it. Later, he sold the apartment, recouping Karen's original investment. Both Jason and Christy received a $500,000 insurance payout from Acme Real Estate for the loss of their spouses. They promptly began erasing any remnants of Karen from their lives. They discarded photos, stowed away knickknacks, and replaced furniture, especially the bed. Family members took what they wanted, and the rest, including two cars, was either sold, donated, or scrapped. 
Jason also navigated the complexities of closing Karen's bank accounts. After months of paperwork, Jason received a check for approximately $250,000. Lawyers approached Jason and Christie, seeking to profit from the accident. Further investigation revealed that the crew misinterpreted onboard computer warnings and made incorrect decisions. The plane descended at a rate of about 12,000 feet per minute, crashing into the water at roughly 135 miles per hour, a journey lasting just over three minutes. Jason imagined Karen's last moments, some spent on the phone with him as harrowing. He believed her final act was one of regret, realizing she was hurtling towards her demise with no chance of escape. Nevertheless, Jason deemed it too little, too late. Fortunately, the airline reached a settlement with all affected families, compensating each passenger with just over $175,000. Jason and Christie received a total of over $1.6 million. After accounting for taxes, they still had a substantial sum. Since neither Karen's nor Greg's remains were recovered, no funeral took place. However, Jason and Christie organized memorial services mainly for their families. They didn't shed tears for their deceased spouses. Three months into her tenure, Christie left her job to move in permanently with Jason. By then, they were deeply in love. One evening, while dining at a local Texas roadhouse, Jason proposed to Christie on one knee. She joyfully accepted, eliciting applause from nearby patrons. It's high time you made an honest woman out of me, she whispered to him. Why? he asked. Because you're going to be a father, she revealed. Overwhelmed with joy, Jason showered her with kisses. I love you more than anything, he expressed. And I love you even more, she reciprocated. Just one request. What is it? he inquired. Please don't ask me to fly anywhere, she pleaded. Laughing, Jason embraced her tightly. Don't worry, my dear, he assured her. 